Welcome to TPM Vids Disney Beat, where we talk about all things Disney. If you're new to the channel and like what you see, hit that subscribe button and click the bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video. You can also find us on all your favorite social media platforms. What's always fascinated me the most about the Disney theme parks are the logistical components that keep the show running every single day. As one of the first modern theme parks in North America, Disneyland went on to set the gold standard, and there are a lot of unexpected operational practices and methods that go into creating the magic. So today, let's explore seven operational secrets at Disneyland. Number 7. One of the staple attractions at Disneyland is the Disneyland Railroad. It's a testament to Walt Disney's profound love for trains and was a key motivation behind the creation of Disneyland. Since the railroad's inauguration in 1955, all five locomotives were built to run on diesel fuel. In the effort of Disney's commitment to environmental sustainability, the park transitioned from a petroleum diesel to a soybean-based diesel product in 2007. Well, storing it underground became a challenge, and that's when Disney realized there was a readily available resource right at Disneyland. It turned out to be the used cooking oil from french fries, corn dogs, and all the other fried foods at the resort. Disney was actually discarding around 100,000 gallons of used cooking oil annually, so they embraced this recycling solution. In early 2009, the five Disneyland trains began running on biodiesel from this used and now recycled cooking oil. Barrels of used oil are shipped to a recycling plant in the Coachella Valley where it undergoes its transformation. But surprisingly, this is not a money-saving measure. The biodiesel actually costs a lot more to produce, but it's all done as a sustainability measure. Approximately 200,000 gallons of biodiesel are required to operate the Disneyland Railroad, with nearly half sourced from the used cooking oil at the resort. So each order of french fries and chicken nuggets contributes just that much more to the fuel supply for the trains. Actually, the Mark Twain Riverboat also uses this biodiesel. So if you ever catch a whiff that smells like french fries, well, it might just be the steam from the train and the Mark Twain. Number 6. The smells at Disneyland contribute significantly to the theme park experience. These smells create a lasting impression, but many of the scents we think are natural are really artificially generated. Disney does this by using a technology called the Smellitzer. Invented in 1981 by Disney Imagineer Bob McCarthy, this technology projects scents up to 20 feet using air. It was originally created for Universe of Energy at Epcot, and the technology was officially patented in 1986. Now, some might argue that by using these artificial scents, Disney is trying to control us, and in a way, they kind of are. Main Street USA at Disneyland is the most prominent place at the park where nothing we smell is natural. None of the aromas are coming from the actual shops, and instead are coming from the Smellitzers. These circular grates are the ones that are used at the Candy Palace, and it pumps the sweet scent of vanilla. The Gibson Girl Ice Cream Parlor fills the walkway with the scent of freshly baked waffle cones, and the Market House will give you the whiff of fresh coffee. Disney uses all of these smells to influence our behaviors in the theme parks, because after smelling that waffle cone, you're probably more inclined to actually buy some ice cream. Now, the Smellitzer technology also extends to various rides and attractions at the Disneyland Resort. Monsters, Inc. Mike and Sully to the Rescue at Disney California Adventure incorporates the smells of miso, wasabi, and soy sauce in the sushi restaurant. Haunted Mansion Holiday features the sweet scent of gingerbread in the ballroom. Soren introduces various scents, like the smell of freshly cut grass. Pirates of the Caribbean infuses the scents of rum and gunpowder. And the Incredicoaster fills riders' noses with the aroma of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. Num -num cookie! Cookie! And it's no mistake that the Cookie Num Num stand is right at the exit of the ride. Disney knows that that cookie smell is still in the back of your mind. 
Now, while most scents are artificial, some, like those from the popcorn carts and the churro stands, are actually real. At the top of each cart, you'll find vents with fans that release the enticing aroma of buttery popcorn and freshly baked churros into the walkways. These smells definitely entice visitors to indulge in one of these iconic theme park snacks. I know for me, I was never craving popcorn and then I walked by the cart and smelt it and wouldn't you know it, Disney got my money. So really in the end, all of these smells, whether they're real or artificial, are really just marketing tools. Number 5 Here at the Disneyland Resort, thousands of cast members bring the magic to life. But one of the most unique roles at the resort is part of the maintenance team. Now, did you know that Disneyland has scuba diver cast members? Yeah, they're responsible for maintaining and fixing all the water attractions. There's a team of more than 50 cast members who look after the Rivers of America, the Jungle Cruise, Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage, World of Color, and so many more. The team includes machinists, electricians, and sound mechanics. Now, a number of them were recreational scuba divers before being hired, while others are actually trained by Disney. These cast members go through a vigorous training program in the open ocean at depths of up to 140 feet. They also learn rescue techniques to save guests or other employees who might find themselves in trouble. It might seem like a cool role, but being a Disneyland scuba diver is one of the most challenging jobs at the resort. Usually their work happens after the park is closed and goes on into the wee hours of the morning, which means navigating the various bodies of water in the dark. The Jungle Cruise water is murky as it is, so it's incredibly difficult for them to see. Each dive team consists of four divers with two in the water repairing, one in charge of the entire dive, and one monitoring for safety. In addition to repair duties, these teams also retrieve lost items like hats and glasses, plus anything else that may be blocking a ride track. On average, these cast members can spend two to four hours in the water every single night, which can get quite chilly, especially on colder days. There are definitely many challenges to these roles, but there aren't many people who can say that they're a scuba diver at Disneyland. Not even Mickey Mouse. Number 4 There's nothing more exciting than underground tunnels, and it's believed that they only exist at Walt Disney World. But that's not entirely true. The utilidors at Magic Kingdom in Florida are widely discussed. They link all areas of the park from one end to the other, housing electrical operations, cast member cafeterias, break rooms, and storage warehouses. Now, Disneyland in California also has a world underground, but it's a much smaller world. Many of the buildings in Fantasyland, on Main Street, and in Mickey's Toontown have spaces underground that are isolated to that certain area in the park. New Orleans Square also has a large space underground that connects all the different restaurants. But at the end of the day, they are all basements. You can't really get too far. The only real tunnel at Disneyland can be found in Tomorrowland. It was built during the land's reimagining in 1967. This overlay here gives you a rough idea of where the tunnel is. There's an entrance from the backstage area behind Star Wars Launch Bay, and it passes under the Tomorrowland Terrace, making its way to the edge of Pixie Hollow. It houses some offices, break rooms, and it's where the Tomorrowland Terrace stage lowers for the performers to get on and off stage. Now there is another small tunnel in Tomorrowland. It was used as part of the queue for the short-lived rocket rods. It runs from the edge of the Buzz Show Building to the center of the People Mover load platform. Since the main tunnel can't really take you into a different area of the park, it's really rare that cast members use it, especially since the Tomorrowland Terrace stage is barely used now. Number 3 Many people see wait times at Disneyland as an absolute guarantee. But did you know the posted wait times are just estimates? You may think Disney has this sophisticated AI formula to calculate wait times, but really, the attraction hosts are the ones who estimate these times. When the wait changes, Disneyland cast members need to physically call the new wait time into the Disney Operational Command Center in Orlando. Yeah, that specific department is all the way in Florida. They're the ones who actually update the Disneyland app and a majority of the wait signs at the attractions. Then the rides with manual signs are changed by the attraction hosts in the park. 
Now most rides have diagrams outlining specific points in the queue with estimated wait times. Cast members always strive for precision, allowing for a buffer of about 10 minutes or so, but there are many reasons why wait times may not always be accurate. Unexpected factors like a huge influx of lightning lane guests and DAS passes, a nearby ride breaking down, or weather changes could affect the wait at a moment's notice. There could also be a delay from when the wait is called in to when the command center in Florida actually updates it. Another common misconception is that these red cards help adjust the wait times, but that is not true. If you aren't familiar with them, they're called Flick cards. In this case, Flick is not an ant, and it actually stands for Fabulous Line Information Keepers. The cards have an RFID chip in them, and about every 10 minutes, cast members out front scan one and give it to a guest. Then once you get to the load area, that cast member there scans it again and it records the time. However, by the time you reach the end of the line and get on the ride, the wait is already outdated. That would have been the wait time when you entered the queue, not for someone just getting into the line now. According to this Reddit user, the recorded wait times using flick cards primarily serve internal metrics and business decisions. They do not affect the posted wait time in that moment on that specific day, which does make a lot of sense. Now, have you ever been the chosen one and received a red flick card? Comment below! Number 2. The Disneyland Resort here in California does not have the blessing of size like Walt Disney World in Florida, but Disneyland does have more rides and attractions than Magic Kingdom. Over the last couple of decades, Imagineers have gotten very creative on maximizing the space that's available, like with the addition of Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. Even from the very beginning, the first Imagineers maximized as much space as possible by building multiple attractions on top of each other. Now, did you know that Alice in Wonderland is actually built on part of the second floor of Mr. Toad's Wild Ride? Yeah, when it was built in 1958, it was the very first Disney ride to be built on two floors. So if you ever pass through this scene and notice that it's a bit hot, well, it's not from all the energy they're exuding by painting the roses red. It's because this scene is directly above the hell scene on Mr. Toad's wild ride. If you've ever broken down in the town square scene on Mr. Toad, you can actually hear audio from Alice upstairs. Oh, that's Chessar Cut. It's pretty cool. I'm not sure where I am either. My favorite example of maximizing space, though, has to be the Autopia and Finding Nemo submarine voyage. Now, did you know that part of the Autopia is built on top of the show building for Finding Nemo submarine voyage? Yeah, once the subs go under the sea, they're really just going under the Autopia. This overlay here illustrates the show building in orange, and then the right track is outlined in black. It's remarkable how many rides use this plot of land because at one point, the monorail and the people mover also occupied the space. Today, you'll just see the abandoned people mover tracks collecting leaves, and who knows if those will ever be removed. I absolutely love the kinetics and landscape, though, that the submarine voyage brings into Disneyland. But the Autopia does take up a lot of space. That plot of land could definitely be used for something new. But I'm not sure if the roof of the Submarine Voyage show building could support another massive show building. So, if Disney ever decides to replace Autopia, it probably means the Submarine Voyage is going with it. It would be sad to lose the ride, but I'm interested to know your thoughts on this whole area. Number 1. If you've interacted with any cast member, you've probably seen the two-finger point. The reason for using two fingers is because some cultures find pointing with one finger rude or aggressive, so using more fingers softens up the gesture. Cast members can even point with their entire hand, it just can't be one finger. Now another reason for the two finger point is done as an homage to Walt Disney, since apparently he pointed with two fingers. But there's a little secret that all stems from Walt Disney being a heavy smoker. 
Waltz began smoking at a very young age in France when he served in the Red Cross, and eventually, he started smoking three packs a day. Walt pretty much smoked his entire life, but he was not proud of his smoking habit. He was insistent that no publicity pictures or videos were to be released with a cigarette in his hand. But over his time in the spotlight, a few of them did sneak through. Here at the press conference announcing Walt Disney World in 1965, well, it appears Walt was smoking. Now, a fun fact is that the Walt Disney Archives actually airbrushed all the cigarettes out of many old photos of Walt Disney, leaving him with the two-finger point. One of the only places in the parks where you can find a picture with Walt and a cigarette is at the Carthay Circle Restaurant at Disney California Adventure. Even in Saving Mr. Banks, Tom Hanks pays tribute to the two-finger point. Honestly, when I'm at the parks, I even find myself doing the two-finger point, and I never do it any other time. Couldn't tell you why, but that two-finger point will forever be a staple gesture of the Disney theme parks. So what's your favorite Disneyland secret? I'd love to know! Leave a comment down below to start a conversation, and don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed the video.